Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on the social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're excited to welcome B.A. Shapiro in conversation with Tim Johnston. Metropolis is the masterful new novel of psychological suspense from B.A. Shapiro, the author of the best-selling novel, The Art Forger, and many other books. It follows a cast of unforgettable characters whose lives intersect when a harrowing accident occurs at the Metropolis Storage Warehouse in Cambridge, Massachusetts. But was it really an accident? Was it suicide, a murder? Six mysterious characters who rent units in or are connected to the storage units must now reevaluate their lives. These characters have a variety of backgrounds. They're different races. They practice different religions. They're young and not so young. They're rich, poor, and somewhere in the middle. Shapiro takes all these characters and both dismantles the myth of the American dream and builds tension to an exciting climax. Metropolis is an original spellbinding and moving story of what we hang on to, what we might need to let go of, and how unexpected events can lead us to discover our truest selves. Shapiro will be joined in conversation by Tim Johnston, prize-winning author of the story collection, Irish Girl, and the acclaimed novels, Descent and The Current. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And perhaps most importantly, please support BA and Powell's by purchasing copies of Metropolis from us. Links to buy that book or other books and Tim's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. BA, Tim, we're so happy you could join us tonight. Thanks for joining us. I think that says Metropolis, doesn't it? Looks like it looks backwards on my screen. Okay. So Thank you, Kevin. One, two. Does it look backwards? Oh, yours is yours is legend. Oh, I have the mirror image. <laughs> cool. Hey, Barbara. Hello, Tim. How are you? Good to see you again. Yeah, it's uh, really good to see you too. Live and live and video. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, Kevin, by the way, for the introduction. And uh, thanks to Powell's for hosting this. And uh, I just want to reiterate what Kevin said. You're supporting, you know, one of the, you're supporting your authors that you love, but you're also supporting your local bookstore. And uh, one of the, actually, you're lucky enough to, if you're in Portland, to have one of the great independent bookstores um, in America, I think. So it's great to be here and see Barbara live. As everyone knows, Barbara and I, uh have the same publisher and ended up touring together back in 2019 for a little bit we had a two-person act going uh, a bit of a duet uh, we slayed pretty much everywhere we went and uh had a good time um that was seems in a different world 2019 but at least we don't have to wear masks here and uh and uh we can face each other so uh i loved your book i loved it and i read it i gobbled it up and um, i made a lot of notes as i read and things to think about and, um beautifully written and a very compelling story with a great complex cast of characters oh, who who all uh would get to know um through the very strange and wonderful premise of their belongings in a storage unit in boston and how their units, their left behind uh, lives um, affect each other and their actual lives affect each other. And some of them we don't really ever see other than by the things that they left behind, hmm. um, which is just a great concept. And so the first thing that I, I really was interested in knowing is, was is there a real life um, kind of a metropolis. Metropolis, by the way, is the name of the storage facility, which is a great, uh, perfect name for it, um, as it's a kind of a, uh, a condensed version of the big city itself, I think. Uh, is there an actual analog in Boston to this metropolis building, which is so well described? 
so interesting. Yes, there actually is. It's called the Metropolitan Warehouse oh. Storage uh, Facility, but it it is exactly where it is in the book, and it looks just like it's described in the book. It's this big brick monstrosity that okay. has elements of a medieval castle. There's turrets and round windows and- uh, Oh, wow. Yeah, and I the reason I knew about it and came to write this book is because there was an article about it in the Boston Globe, like, I don't know, five, six years ago. And there were all these photos of all the different people that were there you know, this motley crew of, of people and all of the stuff that they you know had saved and couldn't get rid of and i thought wow what a great setting for a book yeah <laughs> yeah, it actually, yeah go ahead it actually uh has been sold to mit and they're originally going to make it into dormitories which is really stupid because there aren't very many windows. Uh, no, now no they're making it into that, lab yeah. space, which makes yeah. more sense. Much more yeah. sense. Did you ever actually go in there and, and tour? No, by the time around? this the Globe article was there because they were moving out, um, that MIT had bought it and they were going to be moving out. So I never got to go inside, but I had those photos. And then and I just made the rest of it up. Well, you kind of did, you kind of, you have some other kind of references that are some real life references that I think maybe influence some of the direction of the story and the characters. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of uh, Vivian Mayer, for instance. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little about how her, um, who she is and her story? I should say that, you know, for those of you who know BA, you already know this, or Barbara, uh, her novels and stories often have a art or visual arts kind of element. And um, this one's no different in that uh, photography plays a very important role. And uh, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how uh, Vivian influenced, who I didn't know anything about. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's amazing. So I saw a, document, a documentary about her. Uh, my son is a photographer and he told me to watch it. And she was this incredibly enigmatic, strange, woman who took photos in uh, the 1950s. She was a street photographer with no real training. And she took hundreds of thousands of photos and never showed them to anybody. And they were discovered after her death and were appreciated. And so I kind of based my street photographer, Serge, on Vivian and he is you know an enigmatic guy perhaps you know he's got his issues like Vivian did and he is just an unbelievably wonderful photographer as she was I would encourage everybody to, to just go look at some of her work um, I did today actually stunning. yeah I isn't it stunning me. yeah and, and the these, are, these are photos that aren't really aren't really um, tampered with. They're kind of in their pristine, you know, yeah. uh, original shot image and the, and the yeah. frame and everything is just yep. 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 And she used this Roloflex camera that took square pictures. And so, of course, that's what Serge uses. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and just to drive home the point that uh, you didn't make it all up. It even there's a quote in the book uh, that you can't make this shit up. And you reference, you're referencing Vivian Mayer in that quote. I can't uh, <laughs> find it, uh, but uh, yeah, okay. Page 270 in, in my copy uh, references Vivian Mayer's photographs found in a storage unit. So <laughs> that's uh, uh, and you can't make this shit up. It says. Uh, so that's a pretty um, cool use of that uh, backstory. And, 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 but you think it was the, it was, the, it, I guess I want to know is when, what was the original, was it the, the article in the Boston Globe about um, the storage unit that really got you going? Because it seems like that story of, of Vivian also um, really sort of drove the, the plot and, and Surge in particular 
uh, and it's his photographs on which a lot of um, later revelations uh, are, depend. Yeah, well, actually, this book was has been in my head in different settings for, I don't know, about 30 years. Really? Um, it started, I, I don't know if you have one of these, Tim, but I have a file called Novel Ideas. And anytime I come with an I, up with an idea, I just kind of throw it in the file so that when I have to yeah. write another book, I have some ideas. Yeah. So when I was in graduate school, we saw a film. It, that's how long ago it was that I was in graduate school. It was a film. Now you can watch this on, um, on YouTube. And it's called The Race of Life. And The Race of Life is, uh, is um, let me just get this here. Yeah. The Race of Life is um, a very, it's very short and very powerful. And what it is, is you have, um, you have a bunch of people, like 50 people, and they're lined up to run a race. And this race can't start until they respond to a series of statements. Uh -huh. And these statements are things like, your mother went to college. If this is true for you, take two steps forward. If this isn't true for you, stay where you are. You had more than 25 books in your home when you were growing up. Two steps forward, stay where you are. You never had to worry about helping uh, pay the rent when you were a kid. You never worried about the safety walking around your neighborhood. And so there's about 25 of these. And before the race starts, you see that the starting line is not the same for everybody. And it doesn't mean that somebody who's a really fast runner at the back can't win. And it doesn't mean that somebody at the front who can stumble and lose. It just means that in America, and even more now than 30 years ago, the starting line is not the same due to something you have absolutely no control over to whom you were born. And I always wanted to write a novel about this. Yeah. Uh, it was in that file. And that's what happened with the Vivian Meyer stuff. It's like, Meyer, uh, she, you know, she was in the file. And I had always wanted to write a novel with an ensemble cast where you had six protagonists and they didn't know each other. And then due to uh, like, like Colin McCann's Let the Great World Spin or a lot of movies like this, like uh, Crash and Smoke. Right where these people who normally in the course of life uh, would never have met, because we all live in our little tiny echo chambers, yeah. uh, but because of an event or a situation or, um, or you know, uh, a place, uh, they get all tangled up. And yeah. so that was also in my novel ideas file, but it was when I read the article about Metropolis, about uh, the storage facility that I thought, oh, I could use that and pull all of these other stories together. So that's kind of how it happened. And then, you know, 10 drafts and, you know. <laughs> is, there, is there a point for you, like for me, when you're working, you You've begun what you think might be your next novel, but you're you don't want to talk about it. You don't want anybody to know you're doing it. Uh, you haven't really convinced yourself that you're quite into a novel yet. Do you do you experience that at all, or, or do you once you start, you know you're gonna you're gonna get to the end? Um, no, I yes and no. Um, like the novel I'm working on now, I've been working on for a year and a half, so I know that's going to be a real novel, but. I also, because of a series of other things, started playing around with the idea for another, the next novel, because I have to, this is my last book under contract. And so I need, if I'm going to get another couple of books, I need to figure out what I'm going to write. And I started working on this idea and I have, no, it is just really, really hard. And I have no idea if I can pull it off. So yeah. I would talk about that one, but I would talk about the one I've been working on for a year and a half. 
Yeah. Well, you've already got, well, you're on your fourth draft already. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> With many, many more to go. It's a very, very, it's... Yeah, it is. A, it, well, that's, um, well, bravo for, I mean, having the next one already underway. Well, this one is just coming out. I mean, that's, that's impressive. Um, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, bringing together people who are from very sort of different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, was was that something you, you uh, set out consciously to do? Does this tie in somehow to your own interests and background, uh, your, maybe your non-writing background, going deep into the uh, Shapiro uh, biography? <laughs> uh, well, I actually have a PhD in sociology and uh, Something all novelists really oh, yeah. need. Oh, yeah. it's very should have. <laughs> necessary, yeah. And I have always been interested in class in America. And so that and the race of life, you know, were the idea that I wanted to get into. Uh, and so that was planned. And when I created the six characters, I made sure they each came from very different socioeconomic backgrounds and uh that was one of the major starting points for creating each of these characters um one of the i'm going to use it i'm going to throw your own quote at you uh <laughs> one of one of uh zach on page 110 in my copy says to Lori, I think is one of his girlfriends. Is that right? Yeah. One of his um, many girlfriends. He's saying, uh, he's saying of the Surge found photographs, um, Surge is the photographer whose photographs are discovered in one of the storage units. He says, look how he's captured the essence of the city through the people who live there. Uh, your, one of your characters, Marta, is uh, an immigrant who's on kind of on the run from ice um no for no fault of her own she hasn't been uh you know uh, duplicitous duplicitous or anything she's just there was a mishap at her um school where her papers didn't get forwarded properly so but nevertheless ice is on her on on her trail and that's one reason she ends up uh sort of living at metropolis i don't think it's too big of a spoiler to say that um, but she's an, uh, an immigrant from uh, Venezuela, correct? Yeah, and, and her family has uh, um, suffered quite a bit of uh, political hostility there and persecution. So she can't go back there for fear for her own life. So uh, it's a very, uh, of the time, uh, you know, it's a very uh, timely kind of story, but she, you give her, she, she's also a PhD student uh, she's working on a dissertation, which has to do with the race of life. That's the basic uh, essence of her um, of her uh, thesis, right? Yep. Uh, so I'm just curious how how you come to uh, create these characters, these people who represent basically the essence, you know, the essence of the city. There's six of them, and they're all, you know, where do they come from? How do you? <laughs> I mean, this is a long way of saying how do you where you know how do you populate this storage unit with actual people that we can believe and relate to? Well, it took a, a long time and many, many drafts to get them to be who they are. But there were also issues that I wanted to touch on um, and immigration and the way immigrants were and are being treated in this country was something, you know, I wanted to do. And when I was thinking who would live in a storage unit? Who are the people that will populate this book? One of the things was, you know, somebody who's hiding from ice. So then it was like, well, who would this be? And what is it? And if I'm incorporating this whole race of life stuff, could she be involved in that? And I went, I got my degree in sociology from Tufts and she's getting her degree in sociology from Tufts. And she's doing all this statistical analyses that I did. And, uh, you know, so it just kind of grew in each one of them. And then Liddy, I also was very interested in the, uh, the abused woman mm -hmm. piece, mm -hmm. 
but not so much physical abuse as you know the underlying kind of sociopathic thing so i gave liddy that and then with surge i thought well who who might also be living in a storage unit and a homeless person so uh -huh. that made uh -huh. sense but yeah. then it's illegal to live in storage units so how did they do this well maybe the manager of the place is taking money from them under the table and then yeah. who would she be and why is she taking money under the table and that became yeah. rose uh, and, and it she just, is she is motivated you know not simply by you know wanting to get extra money uh, but she you know she really needs it she's, she's in a certain socioeconomic class too and she has trouble at home her husband is out of work and you know so she's motivated um uh also by by virtue of being a mother and she's trying to she's got a son who's in quite a bit of trouble and she's trying to uh m you know mother him out of it somehow so she's yeah. she's caught in a you know in a, in a bind i really tried to make all the characters you know multifaceted so she's doing the wrong thing and she does a number of other wrong things but yeah. she's actually a good person yeah and i tried to do that with all of them to make yeah. them you know good and bad because we're all good and bad you know yeah so let's let's finish out the roster you haven't talked about jason and you haven't talked about zach well jason is an attorney and he was at so again i was thinking what you know could somebody have an office there who could have That's an office? This, by the way, it's just a great, it's such a great uh, idea of uh, yeah. a lawyer having his office in a storage yeah. unit. And you yeah. walk in, he's got the big desk, <laughs> a nice fancy lawyer's desk, a chair. Please have a seat. And he has to shut the door. And yeah. the door is this giant, oh, tiny right. metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he, so he went to Harvard and was this big mucky muck at one of the big firms in Boston. And then he too did the wrong thing for the right reason. And he got kicked out of, you know, he got kicked out of his uh, lofty place and he is trying to regain, uh, figure out who he's gonna be out of his storage unit as his office. Uh, and he ends up getting it so at the beginning he doesn't know anybody else and then he ends up getting involved with the other characters because they need help from a lawyer right well that makes that makes that's a perfect tie in and and uh and he's got yeah he's got complexities too he's got to figure some things out and he also becomes uh i won't give away too much but um attracted to one of the other characters so that makes it complicated um and then there's Zach, who owns the building. Zach owns the building. And um, the book begins with uh, uh, the auction scene, which I assume is you know, very much like how uh, Vivian's, Vivian might, uh, uh, it is. Yeah. Uh, her negatives and prints came to light. Was, uh, they, were auctioned, they were found in a storage unit and auction. Um, but he's the owner, and uh, he's, in, he's, um, he's in dire straits. Uh, and, but he <clears throat> becomes, he becomes to realize that people have been living in his storage facility. And one of them um, is a photographer and he finds all, he actually comes in, he, he actually purchases that storage unit, right? right. So he becomes, he comes in possession of all the uh, hundreds of undeveloped uh, canisters of negatives that Serge has left behind. And so, even, and he was a very kind of, the reason Rose was managing and got to do the things that she got to do is because Zach was very hands-off, um, very kind of absent kind of uh, owner. And now he becomes this sort of pivotal kind of uh, investigator and even curator of uh, Serge's uh, left behind um, artwork. And this compels him more deeply into the storyline. So was there, uh, how did you, manage his uh um coming into being <laughs> well he actually was a different person 
in the first maybe five drafts of the book. Really? His name was Will, and he was this middle-aged guy who was underemployed, and he owned the building because it had been in his family, and he uh, has a wife and troubled teenage kids and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, an editor who read it, on the side said you really you know he's just not that interesting you need to get rid of him and I said I can't get rid of him he's too important to the story so yeah. I turned him you know I, I just turned him into Zach who is an ex-drug dealer who bought the building uh laundering his drug money so he could come out and be uh and get out from under and be a straight businessman yeah. And of course, that goes totally awry because the, the, somebody falls down the elevator shaft and uh, Zach loses the building. But yeah. he also could get into trouble with the IRS because of the way he bought it. So right. Right. You know, that gets him more. And, how, and he has how, lots of old friends and, you know, does crazy things. And, yeah. You know, he's well, a much he, better character than Will. And, and it seems he's very seamlessly uh, integrated. It doesn't seem like he was, now that we know that, it doesn't seem like he was forced in in any way. It seems very organic and natural. Um, Thank you. Uh, um, what was the, uh, what was I gonna say? Give me one second. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote you again. Um, going back to the, uh, photographs uh and this is kind of heavy stuff i mean this is this is kind of like asking you how you do what you do and i don't know if there's any good answer to it but we'll see what you come up with uh i i, I don't know who says this but on three of page 303 one of serge's gifts is his ability to send the viewer on a journey in his subject's footsteps transferring his own empathy for the subject to the viewer and in my mind, I was sort of uh, transposing um, Serge's photography to the writer and uh, the viewer to the reader. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an act of uh, intense kind of empathy. And I, and I was struck by um, the depths that you went to in a number of these, almost all the characters, and really understanding their um, inner lives, you know, their, their psychology. So I, my question was to me is how do you get to that? How do you get to inhabit so convincingly and, and compellingly um, such a variety of lives? I mean, other than just being a good writer. Yeah, that that's why it took me four years to write the book. <laughs> um, and for me, the I've always been a plot person, uh, and so uh, writing a character-driven book was, I mean, not that there isn't a lot of plot in it, but so it was, you know, I like to have something new that I do with each book, so I I wanted to write a character-driven book, and it, it was it was hard, and it just took many, many, many iterations and drafts and until I could see them as people and yeah. understand, you know, and empathize with them. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they, they all, you know, they all have, each one of them starts out with their own stories and their own problems. And then the accident, if it was an accident, in the uh, elevator shaft throws them all apart, but right. they still have their own story and their yeah. own problems from the beginning of the book to yeah. work out as well as how things changed. And so each one of them has an amazing number of difficult plot points, you know, times where they have to make these very difficult decisions. And for me, in making those decisions for them and figuring out what they would do given who they are and what they've, you know, they've experienced in the book, um, helps me, you know, empathize with them. And I want to empathize with all the kids, even the bad guys, 
you know, basically, you know, as you know, every character is the hero of their own story. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. I, and yeah, I, I was going to go in and talk about Garrett a little bit, but I think that I can't do that without giving too much away, I think. But yeah. um, he's a bad guy. A <laughs> bad guy. Um, uh, so when you are, I mean, you mentioned that you're a plotter, and I know you are a plotter, a very serious plotter. We talked about this many times back on our on the road. Um, can you describe how plotting and trying to do this new thing of a little more uh, character development, how they um, affected each other? Well, or you can just start by talking about your plotting process. And maybe that will. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, my crazy plotting process. Uh, I mean, in answer to the first question, I think that plot and character are sides of the same coin. So you have a per you have the character and then because of the way plot is structured, you're basically giving this character trouble, trouble, trouble. And every time they respond to it, as I was saying before, you get another insight into who they are. Mm -hmm. So without the plot, I wouldn't know who the characters are. And without the characters, you'd never have the plot. Mm -hmm. So there's that. But my ridiculous, crazy way of writing a novel is uh, that I use statistical methods to write my novels. Uh, I along with my PhD in sociology, my one of my major concentrations was statistics. So that's what I do. So like with this book, it, I started with um, bubble grams. So each character had a, had a space and I was linking them up with the other characters and who linked to whom. And at the beginning, there were very few linkages. And by the end, there were a lot of linkages and how how that went through uh, is one piece of it. I also took each character, each plot, each subplot, and I, I graphed it out based on a normal curve. And so along the, the bottom axis is time in the story, and then there are all of their plot points. And so I ended up with, you know, I don't know, 10, 12, different normal curves. And then I plotted them out in time and came up with one big chart of this. Right. And then I got my multicolored file cards out and each character and each plot got their own color. And each one of the major plot points got its own card. So after, so I'm looking at that chart and I come up with a bunch of multicolored file cards like this. Uh -huh. And then I go to my dining room table and move them around and create the, I work in four acts, create the four acts with each person. And uh, then I take that and start to write. Um, you haven't written and, anything before that. You haven't um, written sometimes I write a little bit, but mostly yeah. I'm a cowardly writer and I need to know that there's a beginning and a middle and an end, even though I don't care if it turns out, and the beginning, middle, and end didn't turn out to be yeah. what they are, and that's okay. It's not like I have to do it that way. I just have to know that there's one straight storyline. I you know? Yeah, and I suspect that this has something to do with how um, necessary everything feels in the novel. It doesn't feel like there's any you know, a uh, writer just sort of spinning off on something that's fun to write, you know? And, I mean, I mean, there's plenty of things that I'm sure were fun to write, but um, it doesn't feel gratuitous in any way or, or superfluous. Uh, it feels very, everything feels very uh, necessary. And if you took one little piece out, um, you know, it'd be like that, that there's an artwork. One of the, one of the unseen characters is an artist who builds things in her, in her self, which I love, self-storage unit. And, um, uh, there's a description of a, a sculpture that's a bunch of domino pieces that are glued together and kind of roller coaster, uh, and which I think is probably a pretty intentional metaphor for, you know, uh, uh, how you build a plot, I guess. So if you I, took I guess, 
I said, yeah, that's so it. She, she actually was originally a character. What happened to her? Was an artist. Um, yeah, there's, let's see, there's an E, there's, um, let's just say I was very, very strongly encouraged to edit her out. Okay. Been there. <laughs> Been there. Been there. Um, and I really like that. But... You know, and I had, I had written all these great scenes of her creating. Yeah. You know, the, that's the, kind of beautiful too because you know you feel her long, her absence more powerfully because you went through that. Yes. You know, you you went through the process of creating her world and her her storage unit, um, so she feels more. You know, she, she we feel like we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, and then yeah. I I had to take her some of her plot points and I gave them to Rose in oh. order for the book to work once because I had constructed it, as you said, so all the pieces fit together and then suddenly I'm taking a piece out. So okay. she, cool. so. <laughs> uh, um, my mind is rush racing in three different directions, but one of them is you begin with a, a, uh, a fictional Boston Globe article um, that describes an, an accident at Metropolis. So this is on page one, and it won't be a spoiler to say that there's been an accident at, at the Metropolis uh, storage unit. Someone has fallen uh, down an elevator shaft or something somehow. I don't know, does it even mention the ele yeah, elevator shaft? Later in the book, um, the, the elevator shaft and the whole misfunctioning elevator or whatever, or tampered with whatever it was, um, has an analog, and I don't know if it's fictional or not. I didn't take the time to look it up. Something similar in the books has happened at Fenway Park, and and this is one of those instances where you know there's kind of a intimate kind of knowledge of of Boston history and um, baseball and uh, buildings and place. And I wondered if uh, you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a uh, huge Boston fan. Um, I've lived, I don't know, seven, eight, nine different places around the city and and the area, and uh, I'm also a very big Red Sox fan. And the Red Sox are kind of, you know, they go through the story. And, sure. uh, they actually end up being kind of. I mean, yeah, they end up pretty being significant. Important. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you really something really funny about that. Um, so, uh, yes, that this actually was a thing that happened exactly as I describe it in the book that this young girl was celebrating that she had graduated from a uh, BU with her family and they were, you know, like joking around and somehow she went into the elevator door and it was unhinged at the bottom and she fell into the shaft. She didn't die, but you know, it was bad. It yeah. was bad. So when I was trying to think of what what could it be that could happen, that would be you know uh, the beginning of something that might what could happen in, in a facility like that. Yeah. Uh, old, so I borrowed. Building, yeah. Yeah. So I I borrowed that story from uh, you know, and then I got the Red Sox in there, and uh, it turns out that there is. Um, there is a character who, because of the shirt that he's wearing, ends up being very, a Red Sox shirt, ends up being very important. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the player is Raphael Devers, who is a real person who plays for the Red Sox. And yeah. after I had written the book, it was already in production, mm -hmm. uh, we moved to a high rise in Boston. Guess who lives here? No way. Uh, uh, I ran into him in the lobby one day and he was nice enough to take a photo with me. <laughs> Get on the elevator with him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty That's fun. cool. That's great. That, that should be on your, uh, on your jacket. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, but you know, you, you have the choice. You could, you could, you could not mention Vivian Meyer. How do you pronounce that? Is it Meyer? Is it Meyer. Meyer. You could not reference the actual event at Fenway, 
uh, accident in some way. But you do, and I think, you know, I, I suspect it kind of is to lend, um, you know, more real, reality or credibility to some of these things that otherwise people might say, oh, that would, you know, that, that, that would that happen. But, but there's some question when you're reading, if you don't go straight to Google, you know, whether or not you make those things up too. Although I, I felt right away that there'd be there, even though I hadn't heard of her, um, was obviously a real, uh, real world reference. You know, I mean, um, this is the, you know, I, I love doing research, but, yeah. you know, you get, as you well know, you get into all of the research and, uh, but, you know, you reach a point where you don't really need to go any farther and then you can make the rest of it up. Yeah, so, make, make that's, sure. that's, yeah, so that's yeah. kind of what happened with Vivian. You know, I did all this research on her and watched the video. Or I'm actually reading another book now about her. And, um, you know, then I turned her into, you know, this very tall, skinny man who is mentally unstable, who, you know, who lives in a self storage unit. So wow. he's partly her and partly Serge. Yeah. Um, but uh, so you keep you talking, then I lose my train of thought of what I was going to say. But uh, <laughs> okay, so yes, we talk. So you want also, you're obviously one of your loves and passions is. Um, as we said at the beginning, um, art and uh, artistry and artists, and but your your description of bringing these negatives um, out of their canisters and into visible form um, is so detailed and and uh, natural sounding. Um, I wonder, uh, was that a research? Thing or is you you have a son who's a photographer, so you did you was he your source? Or did you I, just... Well, he was the source for some of it, but um, I actually did when I was in college. I got into developing okay. film, and so actually did those things. I don't remember all that much about it, but as you know, you know you can find out all kinds oh, yeah. of things on the internet. <laughs> yeah, well, it took me back. I was a photographer in high school, and it took me back. Oh. To Dark room days in the all. dark room in the zone there yeah is and, zone and, and, you know, it, and when you develop unlike developing prints when you develop film you have to be in absolute total darkness yeah um when you develop the actual roll of film or you have to be in one of those bags you know and you're doing everything by feel yeah. and it's very yeah that's hard, hard. Well, and that's um hard. uh and zach does it in his bathroom does his bathroom have a window no, it doesn't have it. That's kind of interesting because neither do many of the uh, storage units. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm coming about to the end of all my sort of book related uh, questions, but I did want to, you, you, you mentioned your, um, in your acknowledgments, you mentioned your writing group yeah. and you thank your writing group. And I think it would be interesting for people to hear a little bit more about your writing group. Well, it's not really a writing group. or writing support. I don't yeah. know what, what do you yeah. call it? So, um, yeah, it's uh, I, I had a writer's group for many, many years um, that was integral to my development as a novelist. But then, you know, people moved, they had to get jobs. So now I have what there are two of us and we're the writing partners and we've been writing together for over 30 years now. Oh, wow. And, uh, and so she's my primary person. And then I have a number of writing buddies and we swap, we swap manuscripts with each other mm -hmm. and um, then, you know, critique each other's manuscripts and, and help each other write. So that, I mean, you need a community. Do you have a writer's group? I don't. I mean, I have, um, I have one or two people, you know, that I will, I will show, uh, it's not really reciprocated, <laughs> but there, okay. uh, one is a, uh, uh, more of a playwright, uh, oh, yeah. but I, and I'll read his stuff. I don't have any novelist friends who I share, you know, a whole manuscript with, but. You know, but, it's, it's really good. It's a really yeah. good thing. 
And uh, my husband reads every chapter as I write it, and he's a really good line editor. And then he knows oh, awesome. about what I'm doing so that we can brainstorm over dinner. And then Jan Brogan, who is my writing buddy, she has a new book out called uh, The Combat Zone, which is really uh -huh. good. Um, she and I, you know, like give each other, you know, like chapter, two or three chapters, and we brainstorm a lot. Like we're on, the, I was on the phone with her today brainstorming about her new book idea. And uh, oh. I could not, I don't even know if I could write a novel without her. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, it's great to have those people in your life. And I, it makes me wonder uh, what's wrong with me that <laughs> I just sit in my little cave and torture yeah. myself. Huh? Right. Well, you want to swap manuscripts? <laughs> Well, well, we'll talk. You. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, beyond the manuscript and the book, there's a whole world of uh, audiobooks. Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit beforehand. Uh, you've got a lot of characters. You're, you've already, the audio book has already been recorded. Uh, what's, uh, what do we have to look forward to there? How did that well, process go? This is the so my last three books that were audio books were read by one person and actually the wow. same person for all three books. This book is read by six different people. Uh, each one, you know, each one of the characters has their own narrators, which is really cool. I mean, it's, it's cool. really it's, it's a kind of really, almost. I mean, that's uh, that's a very cool concept. I love it. Yeah, so that that was there, and I got to I got to pick the narrators. So they sent me like three or four examples of different narrators for each character, and then I I picked them. I you know it is really really hard to tell. And as I'm listening to it, some I think are were better choices than others. But of course, it's what I'm going to think. But it's fun. It's it's like a really fun, different way. Yeah. Um, to hear, and I'm an audiobook lover. I, I, I love listening to books. I know a yeah. lot of people have trouble with it, but to me, it's the best. It's yeah. the best. I like listening to them too, but I don't like listening to mine. Oh, no. no you never want to listen to your own. And I'm listening. Why is that? What, what's so weird about that? It's, it's other people telling your story. Yeah, it's the it, voice you, you have, you've had in your head for years suddenly it's got some other it's not it's like no that's not what he sounds like i don't know exactly what he does sound like but that isn't it <laughs> yeah we know that's not it um uh, you want to uh say anything about this new novel that you're so uh well advanced on is it uh, like a place or uh yeah, it's uh, so i i okay. thought this one was difficult enough. And then I came up with an idea that's even more difficult. So the new book is actually, I mean, all my books have mysteries in them, but the new book actually is a kind of murder mystery, legal thriller, psychological suspense. And at, you know, at the end of chapter one, there is a dead body. Uh -huh. But it's complicated by the fact that the person that they arrest says that she wasn't there, she doesn't know who it is, and, you know, they have all the evidence that she did do it. But it turns out, or the question is, did she really do it? Because she has multiple personality disorder. And there are four, actually there are five, uh, different personalities within her body and they're all so I have so I have six viewpoint characters in this book too but four of them are the same person but one is a 55 year old woman another is a 29 year old woman another is an 18 year old boy another is a 12 year old girl and you have uh, to have different readers for that one too yeah, yeah. and then there's the, the lawyer and the forensic psychologist and the art therapist because each of these personalities is an artist and they each work in very different mediums okay uh, so what was the genesis of this one or did this uh, this was this is my son's fault because okay. he said 
he, he had heard or he'd read somewhere on the internet about this woman who had multiple personality disorder and was an artist and had, you know, it did art all differently. He said, this sounds like it would just be right up your alley. And I'm like, yeah. Thanks, pal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like, he just landed and, and yeah, and then the, the forensic psycho the, the forensic psychologist yeah. is also an art therapist, and so she's analyzing all the writing, and then she's gonna all the paintings, and then she's yeah. legal scenes. Yeah. Anyway, so it's um, so I'm on the fourth draft, probably gonna be another six or seven before this one yeah. gets out. <laughs> well. Uh... I'm looking forward to that. Um, I think that uh, there's definitely that mystery element um, that, that kind of drives the story. But I think that one of the main tensions of the story is just learning who the people are and yeah. why they've left these units uh, full of stuff. Um, it's kind of a, just a fascinating, it carries its own propulsive interest um, aside from, you know, who did it, who done it, you know? Um, so you've got two different levels of tension going, you know, I think, which is, and, uh, to your credit, um, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking with one more, I'm going to throw one more of your own quotes at you, which I think, um, there's a lot of sort of, I think, sort of meta quotes mm -hmm. in the book that are sort of self-referencing what you're doing as a writer. And this one is, uh, you can tell me who said it, but I think it's probably Zach, 354, um, page 354. What I like most about these photographs is that they each contain a story, a mystery you want to figure out, um, which is true. Each of these self-storage units. Very good reading. Right, right. I, uh, you know, I went to college and everything to learn I how to read. I guess you went to college, yeah. really. Yeah, you have an English degree. So I don't have any English degrees. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't really get into statistics so much, but. Uh, <laughs> This has been wonderful. I'm just going to look to see if there are any actual questions. Um, Kevin can weigh in and help me, but I'm just, I'm not really seeing, am I missing something? I think you are such a complete question asker. <laughs> we have no room there for any just no, air in the room. We sucked all yes. the air out of the room. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for doing yeah. this event. I just posted a link in the chat for uh, Metropolis. Make sure you click on that. You can uh, support BA and Powell's by purchasing that. Get it at Powell's. Get the one yeah. that you can read and not the backwards one. There it is. There you go. There we go. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And there's one of Tim's books, too. Damn. Yeah. Excellent book. Um, and then also, this uh, event was recorded. It will be showing up on our YouTube channel uh, probably sometime tomorrow. I just posted the link in the chat to our YouTube channel. Make sure you click on that and you can check out all of the um, events that we've been doing the past couple of years with uh, through Zoom and uh, a lot of really outstanding events and talks on that page. Uh, once again, thanks, Tim. Thanks, VA. Thanks, everyone at home for watching and uh, we'll have a good night. Thanks, Barbara. Hope to see you soon. Thanks. Yeah. Live. Thank you much. <laughs>